So there's a great uh, article by an uh, American anthropologist who was doing research in Peru in the 1980s. Um, now you may know that Peru was uh, a place in which there was a radical revolutionary upheaval with Maoist movements um, associated with a famous movement of El Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path. And this anthropologist uh, was extremely frustrated with his fellow anthropologists who spent time in Peru at the time and all of this upheaval was happening and none of them seemed to write about it. So people were writing about traditional Peruvian rituals or cosmology or all sorts of local beliefs and practices. And this political movement was happening just in their doorstep and they wouldn't uh, write about it. Um, so this anthropologist wrote a famous article that said, you know, how come anthropologists miss revolutions when they happen on their door? And this is actually true in the history of anthropology. So if you think about it, anthropologists are traditionally the people who go to all sorts of different parts of the world to study topics such as uh, ritual or kinship or indigenous forms of social organization and so on. And this is a, di a discipline that developed in the 20th century and a lot of it happened at the time of post-colonial reactions um, to colonial governments and a lot of those were associated with revolutionary movements. You could say the same about Peru, for example, right? Uh, but anthropologists somehow tended to miss this. So often you find references in anthropologists' studies of countries in Africa or Asia or Latin America and so on. They refer to political events happening around them, but they place them more as context rather than as the focus of their studies. Uh, at the same time, political scientists, sociologists, uh, historians, of course, have written enormous amounts about revolution. You might want to say that the revolution as a kind of form of political action is the myth of modernity. It's the beginning of the modern world if you think of the importance of the French Revolution, for example, in the way that we think, right? So what my project is, as it were, is to develop, uh, to develop an anthropological approach to revolutionary politics. Now it's interesting that the author of this uh, article about Peru that I mentioned uh, recommends to anthropologists that they move closer to the kinds of topics that political scientists might look, like, might look at. So he recommends that essentially for an anthropology of the modern world to work and to be able to deal with a phenomena such as revolution, we have to take into account, if you like, things like political economy, right? Um, my uh, intuition and my uh, objective in developing an anthropology of revolutions is to go exactly in the opposite direction. So I'm trying to answer the question, how might we connect the understanding of what revolutions are, how they operate, what brings them about, what kinds of effects they might have for people, with much more traditional, if you like, anthropological questions, things that anthropologists have always been looking at. So the question is how to connect revolutionary movements and politics with the questions that anthropologists are really good at answering. Right? So in developing this project, um, I've singled out, I mean, there's many ways one could go about this, but I've singled out three uh, broad uh, areas which I think are really interesting in developing an anthropological understanding of what revolutions are, right? An understanding that in a way engages with people's own conception of what they're involved in when they're involved in a revolutionary movement, right? So one way of thinking about revolutions, uh, which I think is particularly interesting and where anthropologists can really bring some expertise into understanding them, is thinking of them as attempts to really generate a new kind of world. Right? And this is often what people say when they think about their project as revolutionaries. They're saying, OK, we have to completely destroy the uh, ancien regime, as people would call it in the French case, uh, and bring about a completely new order of things. Right. In Spain, or uh, sorry, in, in the Spanish language, for example, in Cuba, where I work, people would habitually talk about the revolution of 1959 as the attempt to bring about un mundo mejor, a better world, right? So as an anthropologist, when I look at that, I think of it as a cosmogonic act, right? So what kind of world is being brought about uh, by people when they enact a revolution? How do we, they imagine the difference between the world that they leave behind and the, the world that they're in the process of creating uh, in this kind of radical, often violent uh, upheaval, right? Now, any anthropologist who is worth their sorts, as it were, as an anthropologist, knows that cosmogony, the beginning of the world, is something that each culture has a m very big investment in, right? 
a very big uh, concern of where we came from and what is the shape in which, uh, of the world in which we live and what is our position in it is a concern of every uh, culture that we study as anthropologists, right? So for example, if you think of Christian culture, uh, the story of the Genesis is a cosmogonic story, how the world came about, right? So imagine if we thought about revolution as a cosmogonic act. Then we could study the moment of its, uh, of its genesis, if you like, of the Big Bang, of the revolution that brought things about, but also the principles of transformation through time uh, that allow a revolutionary society to get consolidated, to get institutionalized, and so on. Right? So to give you an example, where I work in Cuba, um, one of the first things that was said about the Cuban Revolution by Fidel Castro very soon after 1959 when he took power in Havana was in a speech that he gave to uh, intellectuals uh, in Havana who were worried at the time about their own position in this new political project. And he said to them rather scarily, I think in some ways, um, that um, for them there was always space within the revolution, right? Because the revolution is something that it contains everything within it. So everything that exists can be contained within the revolution. The only thing that can't be contained within the revolution, according to Fidel, are the people who are explicitly against it. And they have to be nullified, taken away out of the revolution, right? So this, of course, was a message that Fidel Castro was sending to the intellectuals at the time to do with intellectual freedom, freedom of expression, and so on. But for me, it's also a kind of cosmological statement. It's a statement about what kind of world the revolution is in Cuba. And what, for me, is so interesting about this is that this concept of a revolution as an all-embracing, a totality that contains everything within it, is something that has remained throughout the course of the Cuban Revolution as a process of development. So people today in Cuba, because I spend time in Cuba, I spend lots of lots of time in Havana studying people's understandings of what living in a revolutionary society might be, people talk about the revolution with the word this thing, and they point to this horizon around them. They say this thing around us, right? And they talk about how this thing around them suffocates them, how this thing around them has created them the way that they are, and how this thing around them is something that they cannot leave, right? There's something that they're contained within, right? So for me, this is a way of thinking anthropologically about what the experience of living in a revolutionary society that is now well developed, I mean the Cuban Revolution has been going on for decades and decades, what this experience is like for the people who are within it and to understand it in terms of its original cosmogonic moment, the Big Bang that created it, and then the cosmology, the universe that it created as a political project. Right? That's a very different way of talking about revolution when you compare it to the way that historians or political scientists or indeed political theorists and philosophers might talk about what's, what's at stake for people when, when they do revolution. Right? Now, a second point about how uh, one might study revolution in a distinctively anthropological way and how one might, one might be able to penetrate inside the way that the people think about it has to do with something very specific that I think revolutionary politics uh, does to the extreme, right? which is the way that it connects what I was talking about before, this cosmological element of redesigning the political universe, if you like, the universe in which people live, with a project of personal transformation. So revolutionary politics par excellence is a kind of politics that says that in order to change the world, this cosmological transformation, you also have to change yourself. So revolutionary politics across the world since the French Revolution have been uh, correlated always with projects of personal transformation. So if you think of the idea, um, people would classically talk about uh, Stalinist uh, Russia or the Soviet Union in terms of the birth of a kind of homo sovieticus, right? So this new kind of person that the post-Lenin um, era of the Russian Revolution was able to create, right? And what kind of person that was, right? Uh, in Cuba, F uh, Che Guevara talked about el hombre nuevo, right? And this is, a, which means the, the new man, the same, the same kind of thing. Some people would say that is rather sexist because he would also have to be talking about the new woman, right? Uh, but that might say something about the machismo of the Cuban Revolution, I don't know. Uh, but in one way or other, uh, what is interesting to see in revolutionary politics is how these projects of very concerted, deliberate uh, 
moral transformation of the population, of the citizen, is carried out. So one way to think of this project of personal transformation is to think of it as a form of asceticism, right? So asceticism is a word that we usually associate with religion. So the ways in which the um, religious devotees are called upon to transform their behavior, to transform themselves, to avoid, for example, sin, right? In particular ways, in order to change themselves and change their relationship with the divine, with God, and so on, right? So thinking of revolution as a project of personal transformation allows us to create really interesting comparisons between personal transformation as a, re as a political project and personal transformation as a religious project, right? And this is particularly interesting if we're thinking about revolutionary politics today. So if you think about the most recent um, debates about revolution and its resurgence in the Arab Spring in, 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 uh, in Tunisia and Egypt and uh, Libya and all these parts of the world that have kind of revolutionary moments in the, in the past few years, there's been an intimate connection between revolutionary politics and Islamic faith, right? So looking at how those two things correlate with each other is a really, really powerful way in which anthropologists can make a major contribution to understanding what revolutionary politics is about for the people who experience it. So speaking about the, uh, the recent resurgence of revolution in or revolutionary movements and politics in, in uh, the Middle East, uh, um, when the, in 2011 the um, um, famous events happened in Egypt, the Tahrir Square uprising and so on, there was a, a really interesting um, set of small essays written by anthropologists who happened to find themselves there when these events were taking place in January 2011 which were published in, in, a, in a journal on, online. And uh, uh, these anthropologists found themselves not necessarily involved in Tahrir Square itself, but in different parts of Egypt, for example, villages near Cairo or in the outskirts of Cairo and so on. And were able to see what revolutionary politics looks like when you're not involved in the action, so to speak. So what does revolutionary politics looks like, look like when you are, for example, the wife of one of the young men who were in Tahrir Square um, fighting with the police, worried about your husband, not being able to speak to him on the phone because there's problems with, uh, with the communications, and worrying about the future of your child who's sitting there in the kitchen with you while you're cooking, right? This woman, in a, treated from the point of view of classical political science approaches to revolution, would appear more or less irrelevant to the events of revolution. But when you treat it from an anthropological point of view, trying to penetrate people's experience of the revolutionary project, the experience of that woman can become just as important as the experience of her husband who is in Tahrir Square shouting and so on, right? Um, so in a way, an anthropological approach to revolution also allows us, if you like, to change the shape of the, phenom of the ph phenomenon that we're looking at by moving the focus away from this action of violence that we usually associate with revolution, you know, the storming of the Bastille, the storming of the Winter Palace or Tahrir Square and so on and looking at a much wider a range of social transformations uh, and concerns that are correlated with what is going on in this political project of transformation, right? So in a sense, I think if one had to sum up the importance of an anthropological approach to revolution, it would be to say that anthropology is able to pluralize the ways that we think about what revolution might even be, right? So rather than having a kind of a priori understanding, an understanding from before you even have experienced it, of what revolutionary politics is about, you penetrate the experience of people who are in different ways involved in it, and you ask the question, what is revolution from their point of view? What is revolution from the point of view that, of the people that you're studying? And the answers that you might come up with here might be very, very varied. So what counts as revolution, for example, in Cuba today, might be very, very different from what counts from the point of view of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt today, which might in turn be very, very different from what counts as revolutionary politics from the point of view of Aymara people in Bolivia who are involved, um, in the case of Evo Morales, with the, in the process of change, as they call it, right? So as an anthropologist, you are able, if you like, to open up the concept of revolution and pluralize it in different ways and show how it is an issue for the very people who are involved in it.